The talk today is called Ultra Mapping, the New Geospatial Awareness. And it is true, as Brady very kindly mentioned, that I'm the founder and managing director of an urban systems design practice out of New York City called Urban Scale. But that's not actually what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, I only have one idea to present to you in the next nine minutes or so. And I'm a little bit hesitant to unpack it in this room because I have a sneaking suspicion this is fairly banal to you. But I promise you, this thing that seems trivial, that we all deal with every single day of our lives in this space, is a profound innovation in the 14,000 year human history of map making. As a matter of fact, I think it's epochal. I think it's something that we are absolutely just gifted to be living through. It is a wonderful thing to be living through. I hope you find it as resonant and interesting as I do. What I'm about to share with you is the idea of an epistemic break. The most significant innovation in cartography since somebody first scratched lines in papyrus. For the first time in human history, here it is. For the first time in human history, our maps tell us where we are on them. This completely changes what a map is, completely changes what it means, and I think it completely changes what we do with them. It is nothing short of a rupture in the way that we know the world through maps. And pretty curiously, um, I can date this to a precise date. I can date this epistemic rupture at least the way that it appeared in my life to the 30th of June, 2007. Um, this date will um, resonate with some of you as the day after the first generation iPhone came out. So I bought my first generation iPhone online with everybody else on the 29th of June, 2007, right here in San Francisco, right here across the street actually. And at that time, um, my dad was actually living in San Francisco. My dad was living in this building, 999 Green Street, which as you can see has balconies. And he was living in an apartment that had a balcony. And I showed him Google Maps on the iPhone. And the image was something more or less like this. To a close approximation, this is what he saw on the screen of the iPhone. Do you know what he did? He ran out to the balcony, looked this way, and he waved up at the sky and he said, hey, Ad, can you see me now? <laughs> now, my dad is not a stupid man. He's an accomplished litigator and some, you could even say he's a feared litigator. He's a fairly, fairly intelligent human being. This is the mental model that he carried around with him as to what this map was doing. He was actually, he had mapped himself into the space of this representation, and he thought it was real time. He thought it was unfolding as we spoke so that he could run out to the balcony and that Google had somehow managed to get enough of a grid of satellites in orbit such that real time representations of every single spot on Earth would be tracked directly to this phone. A little curious, but as a naive mental model of what's going on, telling. That to me is the moment that everything changed. Because what distinguishes this map that we see on the screen from these, this is the Ebsdorf from Mapamundi of 1234. Um, this is a map of Nova Francia from around 1600. This is of course the DeWitt globe of 1688. And getting more granular, this is the Nolly map of Rome, 1748, this unique figure ground inversion that shows the public spaces of the city of Rome. Beautiful documents like this, Mog's Postal District Map of London of 1859. What distinguishes this representation, which is clearly inferior in every single detail of its craft and conception from those maps, is not the fact that it's inferior in the details of its craft and conception. It really is kind of silly to compare these things to others because it's an entirely different kind of artifact. It's an ultra map because you can do with this with it. And maybe more to the point, you can do this with it. You can begin to hold the representations that that map is offering you of the world back up to the world. You can do what architects like to call a verification in field. You can assert the continuity and maybe even the identity for the first time of map and territory. Like I'm saying, like I'm arguing, this is a different kind of artifact. It removes the map entirely from the order of abstraction. It becomes something more indexical. It becomes something that points directly with almost one-to-one -one scale between the map and the world. And there are some things that arise when we've removed a map from the order of abstraction. Among other things, we can evaluate this map's other truth claims. What things is this map asserting about the world that we live in? What quantities are brought to the surface of that map? What values show up in that representation? And can we evaluate them as easily as we can evaluate 
the accuracy and the veracity of our physical positioning. We can begin to hold other similar representations to similar standards, even identical standards. We can begin to interrogate all of the maps that we have been offered and ask them what truth values might reside in them. And thirdly, we can make the following inference, which I find particularly found, profound and unsettling. We can ask ourselves, well, if every map corresponds directly to the world that I observe, then the logical inference is that I am somewhere to be found on every map. And that, after all, is the meaning of this button. Say what you will about this button. This map and this button together are together this epochal transformation in what is now a 14,000 year history. It changes the use and the meaning of a map from something like navigation towards something a lot more like real-time decision support. And it changes the way that we read cities as well. You know, most of us in this room will be very familiar with the work of Kevin Lynch, Image of the City, 1960, this gorgeous apparatus of paths and edges and districts and nodes and landmarks that he articulated as ways of reading the cities around us, of learning to orient ourselves in and by them. And the trouble is, is that this beautifully articulated, this gorgeous apparatus becomes irrelevant when we can do this instead. In a very real way now, when we find our way around the city, we're not orienting ourselves res with respect to that city. We're moving through the map, not the territory. We've become the blue dot. We identify with it in an unconscious and even a visceral way. And that allows for some particularly tra pernicious transformations of the space around us. For example, it gives rise to something I think of as foggy space. This inversion of map and territory opens up all kinds of possibilities, including the idea that the buildings, services, and features of the landscape around us that might be perfectly self-evident to visual inspection might appear on no map. Intentionally or otherwise, they might be entirely opaque to informatics, and informatics is how we now mediate and negotiate the world around us. And there's a further insinuation. It has to do with proprioception and the augmented body. It has to do with how we understand our body and where we understand our body to be in space and time. The other day, a guy rear-ended my friend Deb in a brand new Lexus, as a matter of fact, a day-old Lexus. He blamed it on the sensors. He said that the collision detection wasn't working on his new Lexus for some reason. Well, I, I rather doubt that. What I think happened is that his sense of the body, his sense of his own body, and how it was disposed in space and time hadn't yet mapped onto the capabilities of his new car. He hadn't yet incorporated and internalized the extension in space and time implied by the sensor package of the car onto his body image. And when I think about things like this, I remember my dad on the balcony. And I remember that part of us is now distributed in the systems and services around us. So to say that we are even here anymore begins to become subject to question, if part of us is now in low Earth orbit. Mark Weiser once said that the most profound technologies are those which disappear. And I find it very interesting to contemplate the idea that with ultramapping and with how readily this radical change has slipped beneath the surface of our daily awareness, that the most profound cultural shifts might be those which escape notice entirely. You are here. This very, very simple declarative statement is now unfolding in all kinds of dimensions that we might not have been able to anticipate even 10 years ago. You are here. The whole notion has, freighted, has become freighted with new meaning, new resonance. And as the designers and the inventors and the discoverers of new maps, this is something that I would be personally cheered if you would contemplate. I hope this notion is as resonant and as meaningful to you as it has been for me. I hope it's as productive for you in your daily work as it has been for me in my work. Thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs>